And there we go, everyone. We are back again for another fantastic conversation on Friday Night Counter-Attack. This week, I am here with football royalty. This is absolutely crazy. This is definitely the most hyped up I've been for a podcast this year. This is definitely one of our, our most famous guests that we've had as well. Someone who's definitely left their 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 notes on football in history, on football I'm being, being one of the most future iconic footballers. Yeah, I can't even get my words out. That's how crazy it is. I've got to remain professional. I've got to remain ready for this one because I've got a very special guest here today. And I've got someone who I learned about when I was on holiday in Denmark. I learned about her when I was actually um, on holiday. I was in Copenhagen. I was with my wife. Um, and then I was doing a few conversations with fans for, for the channels, interviewing a few people. And I asked a little boy, I was like, who's your favorite um, footballer? And without further ado, let me introduce this little boy from Copenhagen's favourite footballer. It's Amelie Vangsgaard. Amelie, did I pronounce your name correctly, first of all? I think you did it well. Uh, in Danish, <laughs> it's uh, Amelie Vangsgaard. But... Uh, Amelie Vangsgaard. Yeah, but it's yeah. hard. It's That's very it. Danish. <laughs> That's okay. I'll call you Amelie. Uh, but Amelie, Amelie, thank you very much for joining us today. Before I ask you how you are, I need to ro roll off some of your credits um, winning gold in the Women's World Cup against China for Denmark. One of the best headers I've seen in the tournament. One of the best World Cup headers of all time, I would say, possibly. It was a fantastic goal. Um, the current Danish Footballer of the Year, which is absolutely insane. And a PSG forward who scored yesterday at the time of recording as well. So if you can hear by my voice, I am very, very excited. But I've got to remain professional because Amelie here um is on a is on a tight schedule so i've got to make sure i've got the questions right I've got to make sure i start i don't start giggling and ask for her shirt later on as well but i will ask for your shirt later on i believe that will that will always happen i always ask my guests but um first of all amelie how are you doing today and how is life going for you right now for psg and for denmark uh i'm doing great i'm having an off day today so i'm just recharging my batteries uh, for the coming games um yeah doing good in france that's good to hear. Are you enjoying your time in France? Because um, before we get into your story, it's, for me, I find it quite inspiring as well. The fact you played in multiple different countries and now you're playing in France. It's really, really cool um, to see your journey going forward. So before we get into your journey of how you became um, a PSG forward, um, how is it comparing to other countries that you've played in previously? Is it a bit more difficult, a bit more technical? How have you found it so far, Amelie? Um, I would say France is more technical. It's more... All players are very good individually. Uh, players are good individually in Denmark and Sweden too, but it's different. I think the quality of the technical level in France is very good. Yeah, no, that's good to hear as well. And obviously, well, not obviously, but recently the new PSG women's training facility has opened as well. So um, that's something really cool to speak about because you had a very special guest turn up to visit the, the training centre. Who was it, Amelie? Who was it that, that came to visit the PSG centre? Uh, David Beckham came to visit and <laughs> see the facilities, which obviously was very big for all of us, I think. Uh, Think it's, he's... It is big for David Beckham as well, meeting you. <laughs> Insane. Yeah, you can say that. But for me also, he's a legend and it's a very big moment to get to meet him. Did you get to train with him on the pitch as well? Or was he just there visiting um, just off, off the pitch as well? He was just watching some of the training and then we had a talk after. <laughs> ah, okay. So if, for, for so, some of you who don't know, um, for Amelie who doesn't know, David Beckham being my footballing hero. So I got to go to into Miami um, a couple of years ago and see his team. But unfortunately, the game that I went to, he wasn't there, which is really unfortunate. I got to meet Phil Neville, his, his manager at the time, which was really cool, but I never got to meet David Beckham. So you met David Beckham football royalty from the English men's side and also this week you met football royalty from the English women's side who did you meet this week uh I met Liam Williams Wh yeah for the Liam night Williams. yeah they're all looking at you and they're like yeah you've got one of the best players in Denmark and one of the best players in England as well that was a really cool picture as well when I saw that I was like Amelie's living the life right now playing for PSG meeting David Beckham meeting Leah Williamson and they're meeting you at the end of the day they're meeting someone who has brought so many smiles to the nation of Denmark through um through the goal that you scored against China which we will get on to later on as well but before I start getting hyped up and I lose my breath and I start getting very childish which I shouldn't be but I'm very excited as you can tell Amelie um, as well um <laughs> 
I need to know a bit more about your upbringing in terms of how you got into youth football in Denmark, what the quality was like and how you really got involved in football um, in the first place, Amelie. So if you have the time to go through that, that would be fantastic. Uh, I think definitely in the first place, my parents played football, going with them to watch them play football, my older brother playing football, my cousins, our neighbours, the boys was playing football, playing football. Everyone. So all the boys was playing football and me. So, yeah. And then I played with the girls who was a bit older than me because we didn't have a girls team in my age group. Um, Yeah. And then it just went from there. That's really cool to see as well, because it's one of those situations where um, a lot of people, a lot of footballers nowadays, women footballers, that's how their career started, because they were playing with their family or they were playing with your, their friends, but they never had a girls team to play with in their local area. Um, with as well, I've heard stories from the Netherlands, heard stories from Sweden, Iceland, um, Denmark as well, actually, and Spain. Um, so it goes to show that women's football was always growing because pioneers such as yourself, Amelie, wanted to get into football um, on a more frequent basis which is really cool as well so um, can you tell us a bit about your first kind of I would say your first kind of experiences going into um, club football for the women's team as well because when you're playing with boys and when you're playing with girls it's a very different feeling but how did it feel for you did you feel very comfortable very assured and mostly did you, did you feel proud of your achievement of starting a, a women's team going forward? Uh, I think I was pretty young because then it fitted with going with the older girls. Uh, so I don't think I really remember. But ah, okay. obviously it's nice to play with girls when you're a girl yourself. And yeah, yeah, it was yeah. fun. That's good to hear as well. Um, and as we're going into your professional career as well, you had time in Denmark, your time in Sweden as well. You played for Neustjelland as well, um, which is just outside of Copenhagen as well. They've, they've got crazy fan base, Neustjelland. <laughs> um, I'm probably mispronouncing that as well, but it's really, really cool um, that you got to play for some of these teams. How was it like for you playing top level football in Denmark and top level football in Sweden? Were there many differences from when you were playing and when you were going through um, your career as well? Uh, I think definitely the Swedish league is different than the Danish. Uh, the quality is a bit higher and like in general, the level and the speed of the game is higher. Uh, so I think Denmark is a great first step and Sweden is a great second step also to get out in the world um yeah i think overall women's football have been developing a lot over the last years no that's absolutely fantastic and you also took a break from 2016 to 2018 so this is kind of what really inspired me to get you onto the podcast because it's a very inspiring story as well and i hope you don't mind telling it um for our audience as well because you took some time off around two years i think in football and what did you do in that time and how did you get back into playing uh, professional football Emily? Uh, yeah so I took off for two and a half year actually because um, I wanted to go out and travel around the world and have a normal job with my <laughs> school friends and like it sounds really stupid when you say it out loud but for me at that point I was just like really tired of playing football I was sad playing football and I was stressed about playing football so you miss your social life though didn't you that's the thing you miss yeah. spending time with friends and family I understand it. I think there's a lot of things you say no to when you play football in that age and I think for me I was bad at like balancing both I wanted to do both 100% and obviously you can't live both lives 100% so it became just too stressful absolutely yeah, so yeah I took the time off went out traveling bungee jumping skydiving which diving. countries did you visit uh, I went to Malaysia, Thailand and Dubai and then I oh, went please. home to work and work with disabled people also actually, oh, which wow. is also a really like nice like experience to have. Uh, then I went to uh, South Africa oh, okay. uh, and Zanzibar. And so, I went to Taiwan. <laughs> I went to a lot of different places. You got to enjoy life as well. You got to spend yes. time with family and with friends as well. And how was it with your family as well? Did, were they very big fans of you going into football, going back into football after spending a lot of time away and obviously doing very well helping um, your local community, helping disabled people as well? Were your family very okay with you going back into football? Uh, I think they just support me in whatever I do i think I sometimes they have a hard time following because i'm just like i want to do this and then i do it and then they're just like okay we are right here so all the time they're just like standing right beside me and like 
making everything work. Uh, yeah, they are great support, all of them. That's absolutely fantastic. It's really good to hear as well. And what was it that really got you back into football? So again, after the two and a half years, you've been to some incredible countries. I've been to a few of them as well. I've been to Malaysia, South Africa, Dubai. So I've not missed out on some of those places. Zanzibar, I really want to go to as well. I watched a David Attenborough documentary recently and he was in Zanzibar. I was like, oh, that looks so cool to go and visit the wildlife there as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm getting, off to I'm getting off topic as well. Um, what was it that really got you back into football? So you've had your time off. You've enjoyed spending time with friends and with family, with loved ones and working a normal job and traveling around the globe, which is incredible. Um, what you what brought you back, Emily? Um, So I never stopped playing football to start again. So my goal wasn't to start playing football again. Uh, but then my old coach from uh, Fortuna Young called me and asked if I wanted to help uh, FC Norshallen get up in the best women's league. They were going Ooh. to play the qualification and had a really nice project going on for women's football. Uh, but at that time, I was like, nah, I don't really want to <laughs> go train three, four times a week. I'm busy that... skydiving. I'm yeah. good tasting different foods from different countries. I'm okay for now. Thank you, coach. <laughs> So I was like, uh, I have to think about it. And then things just like worked out and it was a good timing to go and play some football. And then I did it. And I think uh, the best part of it was like my focus on helping the club, like going into the best league. And the focus wasn't on like me getting back to football. It was more like, I'll do this and then maybe I'll stop after. <laughs> yeah, no, it's absolutely true as well. But in that time as well, you scored 12 goals in 35 games as well. And for me, who likes seeing strikers continue to score goals, because in the modern day now, as football in men's side and women's side, strikers do a lot more than just goal scoring. They're building up play, they're dropping back in, they're playing all around the front three. So it was really cool to see that you got a, quite a few goals in your time at Neustrieland as well which is really cool. But the question I think I want to know and the, the listeners want to know is, did Neuschland end up getting promoted? Yes, we got promoted. And there we go. That's what we I like We actually won the cup final the year after getting... Oh, wow. Was it, against Bron was it against Bronby? Local uh, team? We beat it Bronby on the way. Ah, oh, okay. Local derby. That's good to Yeah, hear. we beat it Bronby and we beat it Fortuna Young. And then, Your old club. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. And then won the finals. So it was it was good. It was a good year. <laughs> nah, that's good to hear. Thank you very much for telling that story because that was very fascinating to hear from you firsthand as well, Emily, um, which is great. And now you're off playing at PSG, which is absolutely fantastic. Already got five goals this season. Scored a goal yesterday at the time of recording as well. Um, but what I really want to focus on is your time at the World Cup. It's not every day I get to speak to a World Cup, World Cup goal scorer. It's not every day I get to speak to someone who's played at a World Cup. It's also not every day I get to speak to someone who's been to a World Cup. So this is a very cool, this is a very, very cool feeling for me right now. So I'm going to start with a very, very obvious one. You played against China. You had a very good game. Denmark were a very good team. They were a fair team in the World Cup. What was it like going into the World Cup, going into the group stages and thinking, you know what, I've got a chance at making a difference here for my country. What was that feeling like for you, Emily? Uh... I think obviously just getting selected for the group for going to the World Cup was really, really big. Uh, it was, yeah, incredibly like a proud moment and a touching moment. Um, going to the World Cup was also really special. Uh, what no one really knows is that I was actually injured for, I got injured in the pre game for three, four weeks. No way. And, yeah. What, I, what injury was it? I got a muscle injury. In ah, okay. So that's, that's not too bad then. No, but I was not, I didn't train. I couldn't really run or train. Oh, and no. I had to be cleared to go to the World Cup two days before the first game. So two days before the China game, I was not like, it was like either I was sent home or either I could do it. So it was a special moment. <laughs> it really was as well. So for people who don't know what we're talking about, there was a time when... Um, Denmark were playing China in the World Cup and they needed three points in the group to get through to the next stages as well, which is crazy. And Denmark have a really good team. You've got some amazing teammates, which we'll get onto at the end of the podcast as well, which is really cool. But um, it's really cool to see how you had like Haiti in your group. You lost to England. You lost to, you lost to my team, unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. as well. But the fact is you started the World Cup with a tremendous goal as well. So as that happened, it was a great 
great time to watch the World Cup. It was really cool to see. But before I start waffling on, I need to go through it as well. It was a 90th minute headed goal that you scored against China, which lifted the nation, which in a way lifted the World Cup, which is still one of the best goals of the World Cup. I mean, how does it feel? How does it actually feel to be like, yeah, I scored a goal at the World Cup for my country and we qualified from the group as well. What was that feeling like for you, Emily? I think all taking into consideration with the injury, injury not being able to play until two days before the game and just like sitting on the bench, not even like except or expecting to get on the pitch and then suddenly get on the pitch and scoring. It was just like, yeah, insane. It was a big moment for all of us. And I think for the whole team, like it was a good, good thing to get a good start on the tournament. And yeah, it was, yeah. I think everyone had a lot of adrenaline going on at that point. You're actually being so humble about this. You're being so polite about this, uh, Amelie, as well. You came on with five minutes to go in the game and you scored the last minute winner. How is that not like the coolest thing? That's literally one of the coolest things I've ever heard as well. Like You came on, first game of the World Cup, you scored a goal within five minutes, you scored a really good header and you lifted your country's up, country up to first position and you qualified from the group, which was great. But I get what you mean as well. You were very frustrated. You had to get through the group. You had to get through dealing with um, some tough teams and tough opposition. And obviously your injury as well, um, which is why you were in and out of the side as well. But I still think it's one of the coolest things I've seen at a World Cup. So thank you very much for going through that as well. I mean, it's really, really nice of you um, to go through that, which is really cool. Now we have to get on to something where you may not want to talk about, but we got to the knockout stages of the, of the World Cup as well. You've been doing pretty well in the Nations League as well, which is really cool to see. Um, now I've got to ask you your top three Danish teammates. So what are the who are your top three Danish teammates and what have you learned from each of them that has helped your game grow? Oh, it's hard to choose three teammates, I think. I'd do 11 if I could, but we don't have the time, unfortunately. <laughs> No, I think obviously Penilla Hada is a big role model for a lot of young girls and also boys. She have a like she's a really good player and both off and on the pitch, she's a really good person. And I think her way to stay grounded, even though she has been like one of the best fo football players in the world, uh, is something to learn from also. Um I think it's hard to choose like Three you got players. you've got the easy one out the way. You got Penny the harder out the way, so that's okay. You're okay yeah. with that. <laughs> no, I think in general, I I am the type of person who really likes the football part also, but also the part of the personal, yeah, from the players. And I think, yeah, we have a lot of good players and good people in the national team, and I think we have a great group uh, of players who all like can do different things. So I think it's. It's hard to choose three because, yeah, yeah. That's, Pinilla, that's, that's obviously the easiest one to pick. But... That's okay. We'll stick with Pinilla Harder. And if you think of any more, you can tell me later on, which is great. Um, But from my point of view, from a fan's point of view, and for someone who's in the football media industry as well, it's really looking exciting for Danish football from both the men's side and both the women's side as well. You're developing a lot more younger talent that go on to play at big clubs in both the men's teams and the women's teams as well, which is really cool. And for me, I'm a Manchester United fan. So watching Rasmus Hoyland score goals for Manchester United is really, really cool. And Christian Eriksen is also a Danish football icon as well in what is done um, for the country of Denmark as well. But are there any young players from the Danish men's team or the women's team that you would know that you can tell us um, back in England that we should watch out for over the next year or so? Because it's going to be a big year for Denmark at the Euros as well, respectively. I think, obviously, Katrine Kuhl, who was in Arsenal and now went on loan to Everton, is definitely a player to look out for. OK. Uh, I think she had some good learnings in Arsenal but didn't get the... Uh, time she deserved I think she's a really interesting player and she can like yeah she's a really good creative player who can keep the ball and like do things you don't even see before she plays the ball um so I think definitely Katrina Kuhl is one to look after that's good to hear I'm looking forward to seeing more of her as the Nations League continues on which will be great um but yeah before we wrap up the podcast we've got uh, two more topics to go through so one of the topics I have to go through Amelie is your top five Danish footballers of all time. So it can be from the men's team, 
It can be from the women's team. And because you are a professional footballer, I do allow you to put yourself in the list as well. So if you want to put yourself number one, it's perfectly fine. I don't mind at all. Uh, oh, it's hard. I think obviously Christian Eriksen, he's a really good footballer. I love player. it. What do you what what do you love about Christian Eriksen when you watch him play or when you watch him play at Spurs or for Denmark? What's one thing about his game that you love to see? Mm, he works hard all the time, running around all the time, but also that he makes it look easy. Like he he's actually doing the easy things most of the time, but at the same time he can do incredibly good things and nice goals. So yeah, I think he's uh, he have a lot of good qualities in a Really good shooting technique. I think it'd be a great partnership with you up front and Ericsson in the midfield as well. Just spraying <laughs> passes left foot and right foot over the top. You running onto them and finishing them. That'd be crazy to see. <laughs> so Ericsson's on the list. On, uh, we're not going to do it in any order, so it's fine. So Ericsson's definitely on the list. Who else have you got on the list uh, for this one? Daniela Hada, of course. We all of course. talked about. <laughs> Is she like the dream person to learn off when you're in the change room, when you're learning from her on the pitch and on the training pitch as well? Mm. I think always when a person has uh, been named the best football player of the world, uh, she's a good person to learn of. I think her personality and her skills is just working really good together. And like it's easy to learn from a person who is down to earth and nice. Yeah, That's always good to hear as well. It's the fact that when you're on the outside like I am as well, you just think that all these amazing footballers are just top level. They're focused. They're so... Um, they're so driven to do what they want to do. But it's nice to see that Harder's actually got that humility about her to teach other people, to learn from other people and to educate other players going forward as well, which is really good. And it will definitely help um, you going forward as well, which is great. So we've got Christian Eriksen, we've got Peniel Harder. I'm sorry, my microphone. Um, we've got three names left on the list as well. If you put Rasmus Hoyland on, I don't mind at all. It's perfectly fine. If you put Peter Schmeichel on, I also don't mind at all, um, which is all good. I'm just throwing some hints up there, Amelie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, Rasmus Hoyland obviously have been doing really good this year. He's yes, like, that's what I like to hear, my boy. <laughs> yeah, he's named also talent of the year in Denmark. Um, been doing really great things, like getting his, like getting through right now. Uh, still having a lot of things to work on, but he's doing really good in a young age. Uh, then Katrine Kühl, who I just mentioned, is like also a young talent to look after. Uh, who should the last one be? I think Mikael Laudrup. <laughs> oh, you've gone old school for this one. You've gone for one of your greatest players of all time, which is absolutely great to see, which is really, really cool. Um, But no, that's really cool. That's your top five Danish players of all time. I'm a bit insulted personally that you didn't put yourself in the list as well. Like, come on now. <laughs> You, you've made you've made history for Denmark. That's that's something that you should be putting yourself in there. If it was up to me, I'd put you in there as well. Um <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And one of the one of the Danish players that I'm looking forward to watching is Il Isabella Obeys, uh centre back for Denmark. She's really, really good. And she's recently had a transfer now as well, um, which is good to see. So I'm looking forward to seeing more from from Isabella going forward as well. Cause because she's in and out of the national team, isn't she? But I quite like her uh watching her play, uh, which is really, really cool. Right then, we've got two more topics to go, which is good fun. One of them is just me getting a bit happy about you being the Danish football of the year. So we'll go straight into that. How does it feel that you're actually the best Danish footballer of the year in the women's team as well? Because again, like I said before, it's really cool that I'm getting to speak to you first of all, but that's one of the most iconic awards you can get in your country as well. How was it feeling when you actually got that um, award and you're like, oh, it was me that got it. <laughs> How is it for you? Uh, I think in the moment, just very nervous, obviously, because it was on live television with, I don't know many, how many thousand people in the the hall we were, were in uh, so I think, and streaming online as well yeah i think my first thought was like don't fall up the stairs so i think it uh, took some of the nervousness out of the speech part um but obviously really heavy and overwhelmed also at the same time i was like flying in from paris the same day and leaving the next day in the like a superstar <laughs> yeah so it was overwhelming and i'm really happy and yeah, thankful for my teammates who voted on me. That's okay. It's all good. It's going to happen next year as well. I believe. <laughs> I definitely believe it will, which will be good as well. Um, but yeah, a few uh, quick-hearted, quick-fire. Again, my words aren't coming out today. I apologize. A few <laughs> quick-fire Q&A questions. Who's the best? This is all national team related as well, so it's perfectly okay. fine. Um, 
Who's the best player at shooting in the Danish national team? Uh, Sinebron. Oh, that's really cool. Who's the quickest player in the national team? Uh, Frederik Thuresen from Inder. Oh, that's going to be a good one as well. Okay, and finally, who's got the best... Actually, I can't word it like that. I've got to word it differently. Um, best, Basically, who's got the most charisma in the Danish national team when they play? Who expresses themselves the most when they play? I think... Katrina Weyer. Oh, I like that list. That's a really good list as well, uh, which is great to see. Again, thank you very much for going through this as well, Amelie, which is absolutely fantastic. And before we wrap up the podcast, I do want to say, um, for, for, oh, actually, from my point of view, I do need to say this as well. It's really, really cool to learn and appreciate from different uh, footballing perspectives from different uh, points of views as well but what I really want to know is um, what are you excited to do for the rest of the season have you got any plans going forward outside of football as well because again you're doing really well at PSG um, like I said before there's probably I think personally for me you could probably play some more ga games going forward but I think you're a really good player and a very good player to watch um, going forward but have you got any plans going forward more so at PSG Denmark or outside any new projects coming up Amelie? Uh, obviously I hope we qualify for the Champions League uh, with PSG and also go into the final of the league uh, yeah. and also the cup. I think, I hope we go to the final and everything uh, for the national team, the Euros. I hope we qualify. Like that's the next step for us. The group's looking tough as well, which is really cool to see. So I'm looking forward to seeing how yeah. that turns out as well, which would be cool. But again, like you've got a you've got a young team coming forward. You've got some really good experienced heads in the team, which is really cool to see. Um, but before I wrap up, this is something I do with every footballer that I interview as well. I personally believe that I've got the ability to challenge professional footballers at two different um football mini games, I should say. One of them is the crossbar challenge. I think I'm very good at the crossbar challenge and I can beat um certain footballers at it as well. The other one is a game called foot golf, when you're basically playing golf. Um, as a yeah, football <laughs> but I've never interviewed a striker like you before so I'm very very scared to put the challenge out but I will put the challenge out because it's tradition on this podcast if yeah. I ever do come to Paris or I'm in Copenhagen or if you're in London in England as well and you want to meet up and have a challenge of a game of foot golf or a game of crossbar challenge I personally think I would beat you but because you're a striker I can't say it 100 percent. it's very difficult for me to say it but um do you have any mini games that you think you're very good at when you play like two touch or crossbar challenge what do you think emily uh i think i'm pretty average in most <laughs> average that's a lie you're a professional footballer i think you're pretty good at these ones as well which is really really cool to see um but yeah it's really really cool to have a um a crossbar challenge with people because i've lost a few times even though i predicted that i would win and it's been a bit embarrassing because we record it and we put it on our youtube channel so it's not one of my favorite videos to record <laughs> um as well which is really cool and one word of advice from you so one word of advice to end the podcast which would be really cool um if you could tell yourself 10 years ago one piece of advice that would elevate you to become a better person a better footballer um just a better person in general what would it be and why um i think for my younger self like don't compare yourself to other footballers like don't compare yourself to other athletes you have your own journey you have your own feelings like if you want to take a piece of candy you take a piece of candy if you want to stay up late you do that like if that makes you happy you have to do what makes you happy and find the way yeah fantastic making me blush now as well because all I've been having is these cough sweets I've been having lots of sweets recently and I've just been not been enjoying having sweets because I went to football yesterday and my football boots have ripped my Nike football boots have ripped so I know you're a Nike athlete as well so I need to go buy some new Nike athlete um, boots as well you can I might actually buy your pair as well because you have like three different pairs of football boots which I see all the time you've got your green ones you've got your white and your orange ones as well I did my homework on you and I'm a big fan of you. So believe me, I, I knew what football boots. So I'm going to go shopping this week and I'm going to see if I can find the same boots that um, you have as well. Mm -hmm. um, but before we wrap up, I do want to say, Emily, thank you very much for your time. You've been a great sport and thank you very much for putting up with me, getting really, really excited um, at times as well, because it's really cool to have a conversation with you. Um, where can everyone find you if they want to learn more about your journey, more about um, where you're playing now as well? Uh, obviously on Instagram is always a 
good way to follow how it's going. Uh, but otherwise, I think to learn more about my stuff from football or whatever that you want to know is just Google my name. <laughs> Go into YouTube and watch your goal versus China. Oh, on listen to this podcast is also a good idea. I like it. That's a good plug. I really like it as well, which is good to see. And also, thank you very much for taking the conversation in English as well. I know um, a lot of Scandinavian countries learn a lot of English as well, which is great. But the fact that I'm someone who's English, but I speak very quick and I giggle a lot as well because I'm very excited. Um, I appreciate you taking the patience for that as well. And also shout out to Ashley, your agent, for helping organize this conversation. It's a great conversation to have and one of my favorite conversations of the year so far, which is great to see. Thank Everyone, thank you very much for listening. Take care. Enjoy this week ahead. And Amelie, thank you very much for your time. I'll see you next time for our crossbar challenge or our foot golf challenge. Which That's good. <laughs> um,